Okay, so today we have Somya Sankar from University of Utrecht, and she's going to be talking about counting elliptic curves with a rational anisogeny. Thank you, Somya. All right. Thank you so much for the invitation, um, and thank you for coming to the talk. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about counting elliptic curves with a rational anisogeny. Uh, I don't remember if my title was exactly the same, but uh, it was in the neighborhood. Um, there were so... some facts involved, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so today, all the work I'm going to talk about is based on uh, joint work with Man and Bogus. Um, and if you have any questions in the middle of the talk, just feel free to interrupt and ask. I'm totally happy to answer questions. Okay, so let's start with some notation. So throughout the talk, E is going to denote an elliptic curve over Q. And um, E, because it's over Q, we can always take this to be in minimal Weierstrass form, which means we can write it as Y squared equals X cubed plus AX plus B, where A and B are some integers. And minimal means that we can always remove fourth powers from a and six powers from B in order to ensure that the GCD of A cubed and B squared is 12th power free, right? So we can always do this. So that's what we're going to assume. N is going to be some positive integer. And we say that E has an N isogeny. If there is some isogeny between E and an, another elliptic curve E prime, whose kernel is isomorphic to Z mod NZ, right? So it's a cyclic N isogeny. And further, this isogeny is called rational if it's defined over Q, right? Um, so the equations for a phi are defined over Q. Equivalently, the kernel is a Gawa stable subgroup. And so my question is, how many elliptic curves have a rational anisogeny? Now, if you've thought about this question at all um, or seen talks about it, you know that this depends very highly on what N is. Right? So if n is large enough, if n is bigger than 163, we know that there are none. Um, and in fact, we know a complete list of n for which there's even one such curve, right? So there's a complete list of n um, for which this is not empty, right? The set, there is even one. And this list was built over several years um, uh, by Mazer, who did this for Prime, and um, King Ku, who also built on work of Og, um, Li Goza, um, Rene Jolie, and I'm definitely forgetting people's names here, and I apologize for that. Um, but uh, so this is like, but we know a lot about this question. So what am I going to focus on for today? Well, to Excuse me, can I interrupt for a second? Yes. Sorry. So the problem is with rationality, right? So if you allow extensions, you'll always yes. have, right? Yes, that is correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So here, by rational, I mean over Q. That is right. Yeah. Um, right. So, and in fact, not only do... and Okay, so the ones that I'm going to focus on is for n small enough, right? So what do I mean by small enough? Um, I mean, and in a, a small list so that there's an infinitely many isomorphism classes of elliptic curves that have a rational and isogeny. And in fact, um, I'm actually going to take those for which there are infinitely many isomorphism classes over Q bar for which I have, oh, um, which have a rational and isogeny. Uh, in other words, uh, if you're familiar with modular curves, which we'll talk about later, I'm going to focus on the cases where the genus of the modular curve is zero, right? Um, <clears throat> so for now, I only care about cases where I have infinitely many things to count. And whenever you're counting infinitely many things, you want to order them by some ordering. Um, otherwise, you know, maybe your answer is not fine enough. Uh, and so we're going to order them by naive height, which is the maximum of a cubed and b squared, the absolute values of these. Um, and remember that e is in minimal form, right? So that's important. So that's going to, I'm going to call that the naive height. And so a more precise question is how many elliptic curves up to Q isomorphism of bounded naive height have a rational anisogeny, right? So if I bound the naive height by something, how many 
elliptic curves within that that box um, have a rational and isogeny. So let's set up some notation before like stating like the exact counting function in question. So if I take two real valued functions, um, I'm going to say that f is asymptotic to g if they uh, differ by a constant, essentially. So if there are two positive constants, k1 and k2, such that fx is bounded by k1 times g and k2 times g on either side, right? So they have the same order of growth in some sense. Um, and so I can create this counting function, which counts the number of elliptic curves over q, whose naive height is bounded by x. So x is some real number here. And E has a rational anisogeny. And I'm going to ask, um, can I find a function h and x such that n and x is asymptotic to h and x? Right? So that's my question. Um, it's the most precise version of the question. And so just as a quick example, if n is equal to 1, right? so you're not really restricting anything, uh, then you're allowed to count all elliptic curves inside your height box. Um, then you're just counting y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. And you know that a cubed has to be less than x and b squared has to be less than x. And so this gives you x to the one third things for a roughly, and then x to the one half things for b, which gives you x to the five six. Now, if you're so more you precise mean... about this, sorry. I'm sorry. So can I ask you a question? Yeah. So when you say you want to find the function h and x, so what's wrong with the counting function? Why can't you just take that to be the function? Oh, sorry. So, um, I mean, you want to say exactly what that function is, right? So this is just a counting function. When I say h and x, typically it's going to have some powers of x and some powers of log, and I'm looking for what that form should look like. So right? you mean some so, polynomial in x, maybe? Uh, it's not just a polynomial. It's it, yeah. A, a priori, it's not or a polynomial. Like, uh, it could sorry. have points in. Uh, it could have fractional powers of x, and it could also have some powers of log x in it. Yeah. So like this would be h one x, for example. So it is that like for a formula. H. Right. Yes. Yeah. That that's I a better did. way to say it, perhaps. I didn't yeah. get it. What did you say, Olga? Sorry. That they're actually looking for a formula, uh, not maybe exact one, but approximately. I mean, I, I don't know what that means, but um, so I don't know what uh, formula means, but okay. So be clear in this example. Okay. I, mean, I, so, I think I get the the, the point of it, but I it's not the precise statement for me. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Okay. Right. Okay. I mean. I guess you can say that, okay, NNX is asymptotic to itself, but that's not giving you any more information, right? Um, so yeah, you want to you want to say how fast this function grows, right? So, I mean, what we really want is we want to understand how fast this function grows. And if you get this kind of, this kind of function, right? So this tells you that roughly, uh, if I increase X to a certain amount, the number of elliptic curves of how it bounded by X will be like X, you'll have X to the five sixths of those roughly. Uh, so that's what I want, right? I want something more precise. Um, okay, so that's uh, so that's the kind of quest answer that we're looking for. You can be more precise about this and ask for a constant up front because you're, you know, there's a GCD condition, etc. cetera. Um, but we're not gonna worry about those for this talk. Okay, so here's our theorem. Uh, for these values of N, you have these values of HN, right? So, um, the way to read this is that suppose you take a particular um, value of n, then the order of growth of this counting function is h n x. Okay, so maybe I'll give you a minute to, to look at the to Sarah these and see if you have any questions, and then I'll say a little bit about what was known earlier and what has been done since. What is seven is not in the table. Okay. All right. Okay. So if there are no questions, um, um, let's talk about some related results. So um, some of this stuff was known earlier. Uh, so 
the case n equals two was done by Harron and Snowden. So they computed this function x to the one half. Um, and they in fact also did some uh, like counted some other kinds of uh, did, did some other kinds of counting problems where they counted elliptic curves with a rational n torsion point rather than an n isogeny. Um, and then for n equals two, having an n having a two torsion point is the same as having a two isogeny. So that's why um, I've included this in here. And there was work of Pizzo, Pomerantz, and Voigt who did the case n equals three. Um, and n equals three is actually quite interesting, but maybe I'll talk about that later. Um, um, then there was work independently of Pomerantz and Schaefer and also Brown and Nyman, um, who they did the case n equals four and in totally different ways. Uh, so uh, Pomerantz and Schaefer used like very analytic methods uh, Brown and Ammon, um, well, they did have some analytic methods in there, but uh, they also really used the structure of these X0 ends as stacks. And they also did some other level structures, which I won't go into. Um, then Phillips um, in 2022 did a bunch of these cases over a number field. Um, and if you're looking at this and you've thought about X0 ends before, you might notice that there's some genus zero cases missing. And those were completed very recently, like in this year, um, in, in this past year by Molnar and Molnar Voigt, who sort of like wrapped up the final few uh, genus zero cases. Um, okay. So I've been saying a lot about modular curves. So let's actually um, rephrase that problem in terms of modular curves, right? So I'm gonna let x zero n be the compactification of this modular curve by zero n, whose points parametrize elliptic curves along with uh, an, an, a Z mod n subgroup, right? So here, um, the S points, so let's say S is some scheme, um, the, the points, the S points of Y zero n are going to be tuples, E comma C, where E is some elliptic curve over S, C is a subgroup scheme of S, which is isomorphic to Z mod NZ, maybe not over S itself, but after some etal extension, right? So if you don't like schemes, you can just think of what happens if you look at the Q points. So the Q points are going to parametrize exactly what we're interested in, where C is like the kernel of this rational anisogeny, right? So here, um, and so E is over Q. And so, um, since we are, since we care only, uh, since we care about a counting function only up to constants, um, understanding this counting function is basically equivalent to counting rational points on these x zero ends, with some bound right on the height. So that's what we're going to study. We're going, we want to study rational points on these x zero ends. Um, and the challenge here is that X0N is not a scheme, but a stack, right? So the point is that every, uh, if you take any point inside X0N, so let's say I take E comma C, which is inside your modular curve X0N, well, any elliptic curve has this automorphism negative one. And this automorphism negative one also induces an automorphism of the subgroup C, right? Because any point and its negative generates the same subgroup, so it induces an automorphism of C. So in fact, every point has this non-trivial automorphism, negative one. What that means effectively is that X zero N is not a scheme. So schemes, points of schemes are not allowed to have automorphism essentially. Um, so X zero N is actually, well, I should say generically a mutogerb, right? So it's not literally a mutogerb. It's generically what is called a mutogerb, but if that word means nothing to you, don't worry about it. Okay. So um, that's what we're going to do. We're going to count points on, on these stacks. Uh, and we're going to use two strategies. The first one is a generalization of the work of Harron and Snowden, um, which involves counting elliptic curves and quadratic list families. And the second one is going to be on counting points of bounded height on weighted projective stacks using um, some theory of height on stacks. Um, okay. 
So before I go into the proofs, um, if there are any questions. Okay, right, so, right, so I want to emphasize that it's, that it's important these things are stacked, right, because otherwise I would just be counting points on P1s, and that's not what we want to do. Um, we're, we're, the, the fact that these are stacks actually does make a significant difference to the way the height works on the stack. Um, okay, and we'll see that manifesting as time goes on. Okay, quadratic twist families. So the first thing to notice here is that, um, okay, so actually let's go back a step. Um, why quadratic twist families? So if you think about these x zero ends, what really goes wrong? If you take some elliptic curve that has an n isogeny, infinitely many of its quadratic twists also has an n isogeny. And so when you start counting points, you have to take those quadratic twists into account. And that's what this whole method is about, counting uh, or basically taking into account quadratic twists. So let me say this more precisely. So this is a generalization of uh, work of Harron and Snowden. So um, if you remember what I said was that they counted points or uh, they counted elliptic curves along with that parameterized, um, sorry, they counted elliptic curves that had a rational um, n torsion point. And in a lot of their cases, these modular curves were schemes, right? So let's say you have some scheme that parametrizes elliptic curves with your favorite level structure. If you want uh, some uh, specific thing to keep in mind, you can keep in mind x15, which parametrizes elliptic curves along with a rational phi torsion point, right? Uh, and we're going to only consider the ones that are p1s. Okay, so if there are P1s, what you can do is that you can write down a universal family over this modular curve, which means there exists F and G, which are co-prime to each other, which is important, so that every elliptic curve with your level structure that you've taken is isomorphic to something that looks like this, right? So you can create a universal family where A is of the form, um, where A is, looks like this, and looks like this. So every elliptic curve is isomorphic to something of this form. So then you can set up a counting framework, which is what um, Harron and Snowden did, is that they set up this like framework for counting pairs a comma b, such that a was of the form u to the fourth f of t, b was the form of the form u to the sixth g of t, right? Because you're allowed to change these by um, fourth and sixth powers respectively. Um, and then you have the height condition and the GCD condition, right? So they set up this sort of like analytic um, counting framework. Um, and so what we start, started to do is look at this and try to generalize this. Now, what goes wrong with stacks? Well, if you have a stack, you generally don't get universal families. So you're not gonna get a family where everything is isomorphic over Q to something in that family. But because of this quadratic twist business, maybe you can do something, you, you can still like salvage it part way. So what we do instead is we find a double cover of sorts that has a family and somehow parametrizes quadratic twists of these elliptic curves as well. So let's, let's do a quick example to see what I'm talking about, right? So let's do x03. So x03 parametrizes elliptic curves along with um, a, a three, um, a, the kernel of a three isogeny, so something that's isomorphic to z mod three z over q bar. And we also have this other modular curve, x13, which parametrizes elliptic curves along with a three torsion point, right? So here P is a three torsion point. And you have a map from here to here where you take E P and send it down to E comma, the subgroup generated by P. Yeah, and I haven't said anything about these points being rational or anything. So they're, um, they're just, they are what they are, 
right? So there's points right now. Um, so now if I took a rational point here, right? So if I took EC to be inside X03 Q, well, what can I say about this? Well, C, oops, has to look like zero P, negative P, where either these P's are rational or at worst they're Galois conjugate, right? So P could either be over Q or P and negative P are Galois conjugate, right? In particular, what this says is that P has to be of the form um, X comma um, Y square root D for some D. And so um, what you can do is if you started with E, that looks like Y squared equals X cubed plus AX plus B. You can consider the quadratic twist ED DY squared equals X cubed plus AX plus B. And these are not isomorphic over Q, but they are isomorphic uh, over Q adjoint square root D. And under this map, P goes to some point that is indeed rational inside Q. So what have I done here? I've taken something that's inside X03, and after a quadratic twist, I've produced some point, so here, ED, image of P, inside X13, Q, right? So if, you, if I have X, X03, right? So any, any rational point on X03, there's some twist of it that corresponds to a rational point on X13. And why is that nice for us? Well, X13 is not, uh, well, okay, it has only one stacky point, but it's generically a scheme. And so then you can sort of push it into this like Heron and Sloan framework and sort of get a universal family over it. And so that's what we do, right? So instead you sort of like count quadratic twists of points here. That, that's the idea. So um, in general, you can play the same kind of game. So for this list of n, which was not all of the n's from our from the theorem that I talked about, um, we can consider the this cover x one n to x zero n, and this is a z mod n z cross cover, right? And so you can play the same game. You can take something that has index um, that has index two, and create this like intermediate cover, which we call X one half N, which is by no means a standard uh, notation. It's just, we just thought it was fun. Um, so there's this X one half N that we can create, which satisfies this kind of property that if you take a point here, right? If you take a rational point here, you can do a quadratic twist. So Q point here, you can take a quadratic twist to get a Q point here. And so that's basically what we do. And so let me tell you um, what this, what like eventual counting function you get. So um, ah, this is basically saying in words what I tried to write, do in pictures, um, right? So every elliptic curve, I'm sorry, every rational point here has a quadratic twist that gives you a point upstairs. And so um, for these values of n, there is some choice of this like subgroup, right? Some uniform choice of the subgroup so that X one half N has at most one stacky point. So it has a, at most one point which has extra automorphisms, but everything else, it basically looks like a P one, right? So we don't have to, so we can understand it in a nice way. Okay, so that's what the structure is. And so the modified counting problem is the following. So for this, this list of n's, you can find these functions, f and g as before, so these are polynomials in Q of t, which are co-primed to each other. So that every elliptic curve um, that gives a rational point on x one half n is isomorphic to something that looks like this, right? And so remember rational points on x one half, 
one n sort of came from quadratic twists of rational points on x zero n. So now what we're what we end up doing is counting pairs a comma b such that well now a is like u squared times fn and b is u cubed times gn with your usual um well, with your usual uh, conditions right okay so that's what we do we count this and i'm not going to go into the proof of actually how we count it because it's a uh, uh it's messy and uh, has a lot of uh, uh, analytic, well, it's like a lot of analytic number theory and also a lot of valuation theory, which is just going to get boring if I try to talk about it. Um, so <laughs> um, that's what we do. Okay. Um, and there's an asterisk near the x1 half n because uh, we don't get, we get, as I said, x1 half n is basically, or x1 half 3, sorry, is x1 3. And this has one point which has extra automorphisms corresponding to the j equal to zero elliptic curve. Um, so we have to deal with that case separately, but essentially this is the idea. Okay, so the big idea here was instead of counting elliptic curves that directly you have to account for quadratic twists and that changes your counting problem. And I should say that um, a lot of the subsequent work, like for example, work of Phillips and work of Molnar and molnar voigt also use this like counting quadratic twists idea, although their method is not the same as what I'm saying, like, um, but they do have to sort of like, um, so Molnar and molnar voigt for example, they have this strategy of summing over quadratic twists of a single J invariant and then summing over J invariants kind of um, method, but essentially the idea is taking quadratic twists into account. Okay, so if there are questions about this, I'm happy to take them right now because after this, I'm going to do a pivot to a whole different area. Well, sorry, so a whole different sorry, X, X1 half. Yeah. Uh, so, did you say this this was also a stack or this was a actual scheme? Ah, so it's a scheme in most of the cases. If um, so, in all of these cases, uh, it's a scheme for n equals three, it's literally x13 which is not a scheme technically but it's it's a p1 with one a, a single one third point um, and so, yeah and so when it is a scheme do, do we know the the rational functions uh yes well um so geometry how you're asking do you know the function field yes i think uh, yeah you can find them because you can use this like moduli interpretation that it has to uh, and like the map because it admits a map to x zero x one, and you can use that map to find functions on it, if I understand your question correctly. Or I mean, can you say something about the geometry of this? I mean, is it? They're all isomorphic to P one, if that's helpful. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Then so they're they're all P one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're P ones. Yeah, apart from x13, which is not literally a p1, but it's generically a p1. Yes, thank you. Uh, Samia, so seven is not in this list? No, seven is not in this list because yes, in that case, about the, seven. yeah. So in this case, fn and gn are not co prime to each other because x1 half n, uh, so x1 half seven looks like, well, it, it's mostly a p1, except it has two points that have automorphism groups of size two. Um, I'm gonna write them as two points. Um, so there's like two mu twos. So this corresponds to the J equals, I think J equals zero still, um, but don't quote me on that. I, th I think it's still J equals zero. Um, and these two are Galois conjugate to each other. So you like basically can't move any of them to infinity because they're, um, they're not defined over Q. And so because of that, F and G, you cannot you cannot remove this co-primeness condition, which means when you do this analytic framework thing, um, we have to do there's a there's some point where you have to deal with infinitely many local conditions. And that messes things up. Okay. It's just a very like uh, technical issue which which messes it up, but uh, that's basically what goes wrong. Yeah. 
Yeah, awesome. Great questions. Okay, so now let's let's like pivot around and see if we can talk about Heisman stacks, right? So uh, there are some things in our theorem which we're missing from which are missing from this list, um, namely two and five. And well, two was known earlier, but we really wanted to get five, right? That that's what our goal was. And so we started thinking of different ways to, to look at x zero five. Um, and so what we um, so so we started thinking about heights on sex. So let me say a little bit about how to think about this height, right? So we've created this like naive height, which a priori only depends on a and b of this elliptic curve. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to interpret this geometrically as a height on the stack itself. So that was our goal. So let's begin with some uh, basics of heights on projective variety. Um, and I apologize to the experts if this is like too basic, but I'm just gonna cover it anyways. Um, so let's let's start with like the most the nicest projective variety, which is projective space, right? So if I took a rational point on projective space, well, what can you do? You can write it in coordinates, and because you're in projective space, you can clear denominators. So you can assume that all of these coordinates are inside Z, and you can assume that the GCD is one because you're over Q. Um, and so you can define the height of this point, which is often called the naive height of X, as this product over places of Q. So MQ denotes the places of Q of the maximum of the absolute values of the coordinates. And now because you've taken the GCD to be one, this essentially is just uh, the, the finite places all vanish and you only have the Archimedean place left. So it's the maximum of the absolute values of the coordinates, like the real absolute values. So that's the naive height of X on projective space. What would you do if you had a projective variety? Well, if you had a projective variety, it would come with, with some ample line bundle. And so that is very ample for some power, L to the N. And so you could use that to embed your X into some projective space. Let's call that PK. I'm gonna call this map um, phi sub LN to indicate that it comes from this line bundle and this power of this line bundle. And so now I can define the height in terms of this map, right? So you can take define the height with respect to L as, well, you take the image of this point and under this map and compute the naive height over, over there, right? Of, as we've defined up, uh, up here. And then because you've used like an nth power and you want this to be like height with respect to L, you raise it to the power of one over N. Okay, so that's how you can define the height of a point on a projective variety. And so we want to do something similar for the modular curves x, zero, n, except, well, these are not varieties, right? These are stacks. That's one of the big things that we've been talking about. Um, and the height should somehow see the fact that these are not varieties and, these are and that these are stacks. You would lose information if you just tried to map it into um, projective space. OK, so what do we do? Um, so instead, we're going to use something called weighted projective stacks. So weighted projective stacks are a generalization of projective spaces. Um, so if you take some tuple of integers, a0 through ak, you can consider a twisted GM action on ak plus 1, where you act uh, on this tuple x0 through xk by lambda to the a0 x0, lambda to the a1 x1 up to lambda to the akxk. So it's a twisted action. And now you can define your weighted projective stack as the stack e quotient, whatever that means, of, well, you remove the origin of this ak plus one and then quotient out by this gm action. And so I'm not gonna say too much about the stack e quotient, but the thing you should think of when you think of this stack e quotient is that a normal quotient would just remember the orbits of an action, but you also want to remember the stabilizers and whether your action has extra stabilizers at some point. So a stacky quotient remembers both orbits as well as stabilizers. <laughs> oh. 
Um, okay, so that's one way of thinking about the stack equation. So let's do a couple of examples to see what would happen. So the first example is if you took P23, right? So this is a one dimensional object and it's actually birational to P1. So if you took all of the orbits, it would basically just look like a P1. But if you look at two these two points, one zero and zero one, right? So uh, P23 satisfies this, this condition that XY is equivalent to lambda squared X lambda cubed Y. So if I looked at the points one, zero, then negative one would act trivially on one, zero, and zeta three, which is the third root of unity, would act trivially on zero, one, right? So there'll be some points that have stabilizers. And so I'm gonna mark these points out as being a mu two point and a mu three point respectively. Right, so what you should think of when you think of a P23 is a P1 with these two like stacky points with these automorphism groups mu2 and mu3 respectively. Okay, what about P2? Uh, but what about P46? Right, so P46 here, um, xy is equivalent to lambda squared. Oh, sorry, lambda to the fourth x, lambda to the sixth y, which means if I take lambda to be negative one, right? So negative one acts on x, y trivially, no matter what x and y are. And then you have these extra points, 0, 1, and 1, 0, which have uh, extra automorphisms, uh, yeah, of automorphisms of size 4 and 6, respectively. So the way I like to draw this is if you took the orbits, you would get p1, but every point has a mu2 stabilizer. And then there are two points which have larger stabilizers, mu6 and a mu4, at zero at infinity, the way I've drawn this. Okay. Um, so that's what a way to that's what you would keep in mind if uh, if you talked about weighted projective stats. Okay, so how would you define a height on a weighted projective uh, weighted projective stat? Well, first of all, let's think about what it means to give a map into a weighted projective stack, right? So a weighted projective stack is a quotient And if you have a quotient, or well, if you have a map like this, and I want to understand what does it mean to give a map here, well, one thing you can do when you have two arrows that go to the same thing is you can take the pullback, right? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the pullback and put something over here. Well, what does this pullback have to satisfy? Well, because this is a is a quotient by GM, this has to be a GM torsor. In other words, it has to be a line bundle, right? So, uh, well, it's the total space of a line bundle. And because you want everything to commute, this map has to be G equ GM equivariant. And this is actually like secretly, this is just just like this, but we won't get into that. But what this tells us is that giving a map into um, PA0 through AK, right? So an S point inside here is the choice of some line bundle on S, this is on S, along with a bunch of sections. But now because you have this like, um, this like twisted action, these sections are like inside the, um, these are sections of powers of this line one. Okay. This is a very fancy way of saying, this is like a weighted version of projective space. Um, and so if you sort of work through this and think about what you might guess that your height should be, you would say, okay, cause this is a weighted version. I'm just gonna take my usual height and then weight the coordinates accordingly. Right, so these yi's are like powers, or like, or they they sit inside these uh, powers of this line bundle. So maybe I'm gonna weight it out by one over ai, and this would be a very good guess. Except um, this height is not Northcott, so it doesn't satisfy something called the Northcott property, which is basically saying that there are infinitely many points of bounded height. 
if there are infinitely many points of bounded height, your counting function is not useful because then you, you know, this you just can't count that number. So the North Corp property says that there are finitely many points of a of height bounded by something. And this height turns out not to be North Corp. And this is a very um nice exercise. Um, if you're interested, right? So if you take P to be a prime and you consider these points P comma zero inside P two three, all such points would have height one. So you have infinitely many points of height one. And these are not equivalent to each other over Q, right? So this is like the first problem. And so um, there are various fixes that have been proposed by several people. Um, in other words, they've many people have pr proposed good notions of height or what a good notion of height on a stack should be. Um, and I'm gonna say a little bit about all of them. Well, okay, at, at least some of them. Um, and then we'll go back to modular curves after that. So, um, okay, so let's do the first one. Um, well, there was this notion uh, due to Dada and Yasuda, which I think came out last year, where they said, okay, let's go back to this example of P0. What is the, if you sort of look at what is the orbit level, right? If you forgot, if you just looked at like the complex points, this thing should be equivalent to one zero, right? If it's over the algebraic closure. And so your height, this height one is only really seeing this, this point that's like over the algebraic closure. And so this height, is something called the stable height, which basically means it only sees your um, core space, if that means anything to you. So there is this stable part, which sort of only sees the orbit. And they said that, okay, this is not enough because you won't get North Cot things. You need to modify this by some stuff. And um, the way I've written it, stuff seems very vague, but the, the stuff has to satisfy a few conditions, but you can be, but it's still pretty flexible. You can, they basically say, did you just, yeah. So, so this, this like some, like they have, they call this a raising function that sort of sees the structure of the stack. Okay. So that was Dada Yasura's fix. Um, Dada uh, in his thesis, came up with something called the notion of a toric height, which uses the fact that these are a toric stack, but we won't go into that. Um, but that was another um, proposed idea, which also satisfies the North Cod property. Um, Deng, in the late 90s, so I think this paper came out in 1998, where he proposed this notion of size, which also turned out to not be multiplicative. And, uh, you know, even though he doesn't use the language of stacks, um, it's a pretty nice function and actually just does see the stacky structure to some extent. And this was used by Brown and Neman and also Phillips in counting. So this is something called the size function. And the last one is the thing that I'm going to focus on the most. Um, so this uh, was worked by Ellenberg, Satyar, and Zurich Brown, where they proposed the definition of a height with respect to a line bundle. So this is generalizing the notion of a way height on projective varieties. So they they produce this um, this height and how to think about this. But roughly speaking, so I'm I'm not going to give you the full blown definition. But in the case of, that we're thinking about, let's see what they philosophically what they were trying to say is the following. Okay, so you have this point P zero. What is the difference between P0 and 1, 0? Well, one of the issues is that P0 is not an integral point of P2, 3. It's a rational point, but it's not an integral point because when you reduce it mod P, you get 0, 0. That's bad, right? Um, okay, but if you base change this to Q join square root P, you would get something that is now equivalent to 1, 0. And so their proposition was that whatever your height is, well, it should see this point one zero, but it should also see the ramification in this extension Q square root P. So um, 
their height sort of decomposes into this like stable part and something which I'm going to call the unstable part, which sees the ramification ramification in certain extensions. Right. So this is also sort of fits into this framework of modifying it by this stuff. But they said that this stuff is like really measuring something arithmetic about the stack. OK, so when you so when you go through all of that jargon and all of that nonsense, what happens? Um, so here is the proposition that they prove. Right. So let's say X is a is, is the stack over spec OK, where K is the number field. Um, L is some line bundle um, on on X, and now you want to take a power of that line bundle and say it's generically globally generated by a bunch of sections. Um, this is like the analog of mapping to a projective variety. So here instead you're like mapping to a weighted projective stack, right? So not every stack admits such a line bundle, but you can sort of, if you don't want to think about the technicalities of this, you can just think about this as having a map into a stack. Um, OK. And now is, let's say you take your point and you pull back these sections. Then the height is given by this product of local factors, where q sub nu is the size of the residue field at that place, which is something that shows up in, in usual heights for varieties as well, to the power of some um, local factor, well, to it's, it's the power of something that has a very nice formula. In particular, it looks like these, sorry, this plus should be here. Um, it has these like max of Xi's as you would, you might expect, but it also has the ceiling function. And the ceiling sort of really captures the stackiness, even though it looks kind of, um, it, it looks extraneous, but but it really comes from the fact that, that you have a stack. And OK, so what does that tell us about weighted projective stacks, right? We don't care about general stacks in the world. But um, well, at least not for now. Um, so now you have this point. What this tells us, this proposition, if you simplify what it, what it tells you in this case, then the height with respect to what is called O of one on this weighted projective stack is the max of these yi to the one over ai's, perhaps up to a bounded constant. And this is the crucial part that here, notice that there's no product. It's only the Archimedean place. So it does actually look a lot like what happens in the case of um, usual projective spaces. Okay. And um, I should say that it sort of reduces to this case because you're over Q. If you're over a general number field, um, it's not as clean as this. So you do have to take all of these local factors into consideration. And then the, um, yeah, then things become more hairy, but we won't worry about that for now. Okay, so we did all of that. So that was an aside on projective stack, weighted projective stacks and heights on them. Um, what does this tell us about modular curves? So let's go back to what we started with, which is the naive height of the elliptic curve. Well, the naive height was defined as the max of a cubed and b squared. And just to recall, um, modular curves come with very nice line bundles on them. They come with, the, with something called the Hodge bundle, whose sections are basically modular forms. So, um, if if you, the, well, I think different people like to think of the Hodge bundle differently, but you can think of this as the bundle whose sections are modular form. Its sections are modular forms of weight k. Okay, so how does this help us? Well, if you recall, a up to a constant is the Eisenstein series of weight four. And B up to a constant is the Eisenstein series of weight six. And 
e4 cubed and e6 squared globally generate lambda to the 12th in the sense that they don't simultaneously vanish. And so what that tells us is that there is this map from x0, 1 to p4, 6 that sends this elliptic curve to a, b. And this also tells you exactly why you can remove fourth powers from a and six powers from b is because you get a map to p4, 6. And in fact, this map is an isomorphism over z adjoin 1 over 6. Right? But the but the point is that there is this map, and the naive height from the formulas that we did before is the 12th power of the height of a point on P46. And so even on X0N, because X0N admits a map to X01, right? And um, the naive height essentially only really cares about the coordinates of your elliptic curve, even on X0N the whole upshot of everything we've done so far is that the naive height is up to a constant, the 12th power of the height with respect to the Hodge bundle. Okay, how am I doing on time? Okay, I will think I should be able to finish. Okay, so if you take nothing away from this talk, I think this, like, this, is, this is the one thing that you should take away is that the naive height comes from geometry, even in the case of stacks, right? So somehow, it's this thing that's only defined in terms of coordinates and looks very artificial if you're coming coming at it or looking at it for the first time. But it's it really does come from geometry. It could capture something about the geometry of the moduli space. So that's what we're gonna use. Okay, so how do we use this? Well, now that you know that it comes from a line bundle, again, if you don't care about constants, um, now A and B are not special anymore. I can change, so they're just sections of some line bundle, right? So I can change A and B to other modular forms that I like, or that make my life easier. So instead of, you, so what I really need to use is this, this particular height, really. And so if I only care about this height, I only need sections of powers of lambda, and now, I can use my favorite sections. I don't have to stick to A and B anymore. So, well, the reason that helps us a lot is that modular curves are very widely studied. People know a lot about what modular forms on X0 and look like, right? So here is a description of some of the rings of modular forms that are known. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but this is like the list that we use. So um, I'm only referring to this, these ones. Right, so if, the, if you look at the ring of modular forms in X0N, you get these particular generators and relations. So the way to read this is as follows. So if you take a particular N, uh, the, the ring of modular forms is gener has three generators, A, B, and C, where A has degree two. Um, in other words, it has weight two, so it's a weight two modular form. B has weight four, should I wait here? Um, and C has weight six. Right? And they satisfy the relation B squared minus AC equals zero, right? So the ring of modular forms here looks like C adjoin ABC modulo B squared minus AC. Another way of thinking about this is that X03 can be embedded, well, embedding is a strong word here, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll say embedded for now, um, into P246, as this conic b squared minus ac. And so this makes our life easier. So instead of using the modular forms of e4 and e6, I'm gonna use these modular forms a, b, and c instead, and sort of use the ESZB height machine again to change our counting problem into something simpler. So for example, for x03, this would reduce to counting triples a, b, c such that a is less than x to the one sixth, b is less than x to the one third, c is less than x to the one half, b squared equals ac, and this gcd is 12th power free. And the reason for taking this is that, well, a has degree um, two, b has degree four, and c has degree six. So a to the sixth, b cubed, and c squared, they generate the same line bundle, right? They, or they're sections of a common line bundle. And so, um, 
the ESC behind machine tells us that you can just count this. Now, this is much easier than counting, um, I don't know, um, Weierstrass equations subject to the conditions that A and B uh, are, are, are uh, subject to the conditions coming from, say, a division polynomial, right? So using division polynomials, you can always figure out what can, relations A and B should satisfy. Um, but those are complicated, and as n grows, they become more and more complicated. Um, and so that's what we did. So we counted, we made our counting problem simpler and counted those points instead. Um, okay, so I think I will stop here because I think I'm out of time. Yes. So thank you.